Hello boys and girls, welcome back to another lesson in Algebra 1. This is Mr. Bean, and today we're going to finish off our unit 11, dealing with solving quadratics. Today we're going to focus on what's called completing the square. Completing the square is not that difficult. In fact, it's actually one of my favorite ways of solving quadratics, but most kids do not remember it much past uh, really the lesson that they're dealing with it in. Um, but if you can remember, this is actually a pretty fast, easy way to solve quadratics. Let me explain a little bit about what we're doing. So if I have this weird shape here, completing the square means that we're going to take something and add it so that it makes a perfect square. So in other words, if I were to be able to somehow fill in this corner right here with some area that would make it a perfect square, then that is what's called completing the square. So that's the visual of it, but why would we want to be able to do that? It actually has uh, three main uses in algebra. We are going to focus on this use today, solving a quadratic equation. You can, it also helps you to be able to put something into a vertex form for quadratic, like uh, a vertex form is what Mr. Sullivan taught us back in Unit 10. And then also conic sections, which are ellipses, circles, hyperbolas, stuff that you don't have to worry about until you get maybe Algebra 2, pre-calculus, depending on what class you're in. So again, this stuff will come up again for completing the square. But for today, we're going to keep it really easy and just use it to solve equations. So let me give you some examples using just numbers and not worry about any type of crazy variables. So if I had the number 7, and I want to complete the square with number 7, you have to think, all right, well, what's the perfect square I'm trying to get to? If I'm starting with 7, the perfect square that's just larger than 7 is a 9. So how much do I have to add to 7? 2. 7 plus 2 would equal 9. And then if I were to write that as a number that's being squared, that would be 3 squared. Adding 2 is what's called completing the square, so that you have a perfect square of 9. So 50, think about this. What's the next largest perfect square above 50? That would be 64. 49 is just under 50. 64 is the next one. So what am I adding? I'm adding a 14. 14 would be completing the square. And then how do I write it as a number that's being squared? That is the same thing as saying 8 squared. Now, before we get into how to do that same thing with a bunch of variables, i got to make sure you remember some uh, some terminology, and that is quadratic term, linear term, constant term. Go ahead and write out this expression here. This is a quadratic expression, ax squared plus bx plus c. We've been seeing this quite a bit in these last few units. And you need to know that the very first term is the quadratic term. This thing that's the variable being squared, doesn't matter what the coefficient is, but that whole thing right there is the quadratic term. So that makes this thing here in the middle the bx, that is the linear term. When you have a variable just to the first power, it's called a linear term. And then when you have no variable at all, variable at all and it's just a, a c constant, then it is considered the constant term. Okay, That's important for us to know what those mean because I'm going to refer back to them. So when I say a quadratic term and a linear term, you need to know what I'm talking about in this lesson. Get that written down if you don't have it yet. So here's a big mess of a table that we're going to fill out. Watch how easy this is. Here's what you do to complete a square. When you have a quadratic term and a linear term, what you do is you just make sure that this is a 1 in front, which all of these are. So these are all 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. I'll remind you that as the lesson goes on. And then you just take this right here, and you take half of it, which is 7. And then you square it. And I put plus 49. I'm going to add a 49 to create a perfect square trinomial. This is a trinomial, and it is a perfect square. Why? Because if I factor this, it would factor into x plus 7 times x plus 7. See, if I multiplied all that out, you'd get x plus 14, x plus 49. And then, since they're both the same thing, I can just write it one time. x plus 7. I oh, forget it. Let me just get rid of I actually have it underneath there. x plus 7 quantity squared. All right, so let's do this back here again. How do we do this? x squared plus 18x. What do we add to complete the square? You look at this middle number 18, the linear term. You take half of that number, which is 9, and you square it and get 81. And then you factor that. If you factor this thing, you get x plus 9 times x plus 9. And then that's just the same thing as saying x plus 9 quantity squared. Okay, seeing how this works? So let's try it again. Here, uh, again, it has to be a 1 in front. 
and then I'm going to look at the B, but this time it's a minus 10. That is important to recognize. It's minus 10. So when it's a minus 10, but we still square it, you get a positive 25. Or minus 10, half of that is 5. Sorry, I said that wrong. Half of 10 is 5, negative 5. Square it, you get 25. But now here, when you factor it, it's going to be x minus 5 on both of them, as opposed to the ones up above were both plus. It's because of this minus 10 here. So just remember that with your factoring skills. And then, of course, x minus 5, quantity squared. All right, this one is a little trickier. So x plus 5, how in the world are we going to do that? Well, if I want to take half of 5, I'm going to take 5, half of it. Okay, yeah, I could say that's a decimal and get 2.5 and then try and square that. But, oh, my goodness, that's hard to do. Uh, 2.5 times 2.5, that's going to take forever without a calculator. But watch, this is where fractions are so nice. If I just take 5 halves and square it, 5 halves times 5 halves, I get 25 over 4. Think about that. 5 squared and a 2 squared is just 4. Oh, man, that is so nice. So then I go here, and I think, okay, how do I factor that? Whoa, Mr. Bean, I did not know that that's what it was. Well, there is a pattern here that I'm hoping you will see in just a minute, and I'll show you what that pattern is. And then we get a quantity squared, x plus 5 halves. Okay, so let's try this next one. We take this middle term, the linear term of a negative 9, and I have to take half of it. So that's negative 9 divided by 2. But then when you square that, you get 81 over 4. And it, again, it is positive. So that's what we're adding on to the end of this. Now that creates a perfect square trinomial. So what goes here, in order to factor it, it's going to be minus 9 halves. So what you're supposed to try to pick up on as we're going through here is that these factors, whoops, excuse me, these factors every single time, it's always half of b. Half of 14 was 7. Half of 18 was 9. Half of negative 10, negative 5. Half of 5 is 5 halves. Half of negative 9, negative 9 half. It's the same thing over and over again. And when you get used to that pattern, it is so fast to do this. So then this just becomes an x minus 9 halves quantity squared. OK, so now that you have that, let's turn it into crazy rule variables. And here's the rule. When you have a perfect square trinomial, all you have to do is that the constant is the same thing as half of b, and then you square it. So when you're trying to figure out what the constant is, let me show you. You take, if this is b, remember here it always has to be a 1 in front, and then whatever we have here, you say, I'm going to take half of it and square it. Half of that, square it. That's simple. And then that factors to this. It's always going to be x plus half of b. And then you can just write that as a quantity squared of x plus half of b. Now, this thing here might be a little confusing. Don't stress about it if you don't really get this whole thing memorized thing, because it's just kind of a process. If you look through this and understood how we get these numbers, and this is our goal, this side of it right here is what we're trying to get to, to be able to complete the square into a perfect quantity squared. That's what we're trying to get. And if you understand the steps from here to here, that's the idea. OK, so let's go ahead and use this now to solve some equations. So when we solve these problems, we need to be able to focus in on that right there, the quadratic term and the linear term. We want it to, instead of equaling 0 like we keep doing with all of the things before, like factoring, quadratic formula, when we complete the square, we want to get the quadratic term plus 8x plus this linear term here by themselves on one side. So I am going to subtract the 15 over here. OK, now we go ahead and complete the square. So you remember what we were doing before? We take half of b, and we square it. So half of b is 4. Squared is going to be a 16. I'm going to add a 16 on the left, and that means I have to add a 16 on the right. When you do that, that leads us to this. A quantity squared that's going to equal negative 15 plus 16 is 1. OK, so hopefully you followed that, negative 15 plus 16. Hopefully you understand why I said 16, because it's half of b squared. Now, I put a quantity squared because, look back here, I'm skipping this step right here. I'm skipping the middle part. Instead of factoring it and then writing it as a quantity squared, I know that I could just jump straight to the quantity squared part, because it's going to be x plus 4 times x plus 4. 
4 squared will give me the 16. Okay, so that's going to take a little bit of practice for you to get used to that, but it's not too hard because it's the same thing over and over again. Now I take the square root of both sides, and this problem is now just like what we did back in 11.2, uh, where you're just solving for this square thing. And remember, when I take the square root of two sides, I have a plus or minus 1. And now I have two equations, x plus 4 equals 1, or x plus 4 equals negative 1. And then my answer is x equals negative 3, because I'm subtracting 4, or x equals negative 5, because I'm subtracting 4. And whoa, that was messy. Negative 5. There we go. So there are my two answers. And some of you might be thinking, oh my goodness, Mr. Bean, why didn't you just factor it? It would have been so much faster to factor x plus 3, x plus 5. Boom, you got your answers. Yes, you're right. I probably would have factored this problem if I had it at the beginning. But sometimes you don't know how it factors, and it's a little hard. So again, completing the square, it's just one more way of another tool you put in your toolbox, just like the quadratic formula. Plus, not all of them are going to be nice and pretty like this first one. All right, let's try the second one here. So this time, again, we want to make sure that it has a 1 in front, which in this case it does. And we want the quadratic term and the linear term isolated. They've got to be together on one side with uh, the constant term on the other side. All right, now let's go ahead and complete the square. Half of negative 12 is negative 6. But when you square it, you get a positive 36. So I'm going to add a 36 on the left and add a 36 on the right. I don't know what the heck's going on with my pin there. Sorry. So now I'm going to jump to a quantity squared that equals negative 28 plus 36. That is 8. All right, so what goes in here? x squared minus 12x plus 36 is a nice perfect trinomial, perfect square trinomial. And it factors to x minus 6. So be careful there. It was a minus 6 this time because you're taking half of b. b was negative 12. You take half of it. There's the minus 6. OK, square root both sides. So I get x minus 6 equals plus or minus the square root of 8. I'm going to go ahead and right now save myself some time and just say that 8 is 4 times 2 because I see that the square root of 8 is going to simplify. All right, and then we get down here to our final answer. Add 6 to both sides. You get 6 plus or minus. Square root of 4 is 2. Radical 2. There's my answer. And just remember, this is two different answers, right? If I was trying to find the decimal, I'd have to do 6 plus this blah, blah, and then 6 minus the blah, blah. So uh, and if we were to graph this parabola, if you were to graph this thing, and there was some type of x-axis that it was going through, then if we set it equal to 0 and solve, kind of like this one over here, then these two answers represent the zeros. So if we made it equal 0, boom, these are the answers that you're finding for this thing. OK, let's try another one. So we have a 1 in front, so we're allowed to do completing the square. And we want to get the quadratic and the linear term all by themselves. So let's add the 1 over first. That's our first step. x squared plus 3x equals 1. Now the next thing is to take half of b and square it. Well, that's a little tricky, because half of b would be 1.5. And then if you square it, you get, I don't know, because 1.5 squared is hard. So don't use decimals. Use fractions. Watch. Half of 3 is 3 halves. Real simple. When you square that, you get 9 fourths. That is so much easier than trying to do 1.5 squared. All right, so I'm going to add 9 fourths. And I'm going to add 9 fourths. All right, so now I'm going to have my quantity squared equals. OK, so this gets a little tricky here because you have to know your addition rules with fractions. 1 plus 9 fourths. But come on, that's not that bad. 1 is the same thing as 4 fourths plus 9 fourths. 4 fourths plus 9 fourths is 13 fourths. All right, and then over here I have x plus half of b, which is 3 halves. And that's how we factor it. OK, take the square root of both sides, and we're almost done. x plus 3 halves equals the, oh, i got to do plus or minus. Don't forget that. Plus or minus 
the square root of 13 fourths. Final answer here, x equals negative 3 halves. Why is it negative? Because I brought it over to the right side, negative 3 halves, plus or minus. OK, watch what I'm doing here. The square root of 13 does not simplify, but the square root of 4 does. Square root of 4 is 2. So there's my answer. Negative 3 halves plus or minus the square root of 13 halves. OK, almost finished here. Last example. Now, every single one of these problems, I've been trying to remind you that the first leading coefficient here, this a, has to be a 1. And when it's not a 1, you can't complete the square. It's just not going to work. It's really hard and challenging. So what we do is when you see that there is a, uh, a number here that's not 1, we are just going to go ahead and divide both sides of the equation by a negative 3. Negative 3. Negative 3. OK, so whatever a is, you just divide by that number and make it be a 1. So sometimes you get some weird fractions in here, but I try to make the problems a lot easier than that so that I wouldn't trip you up in that case. So now this becomes an x squared minus 24 divided by negative 3, right? Positive, negative, that's an 8x equals 27 divided by negative 3 is negative 9. Now we do it just like the rest. So from here on out, I'm going to have you pause the video now. Why don't you try to finish this problem, and I'll see if your answer is the same as mine. All right, hopefully your answer matched up with mine. 4 plus or minus the square root of 7. Did I do that right? Negative 9 plus 16. Yep, that should be it. OK, good. We finished our last example. Hopefully that makes enough sense for you. I did add there at the end of your notes just a couple little strategies as reminders. And that is just make sure you've got the quadratic term and the linear term on one side together. Anything else, the constant should be on the other. And then the a has to be a 1. If it's not a 1, you've got to divide everything, just like that last example that we just did here where we had to divide by negative 3. And then just remember that fractions are so much easier to work with than decimals. I know you don't think it because you're so used to trying to just throw something in a calculator, but look. 3 halves squared is nice and easy 9 fourths compared to 1.5. OK, so don't be afraid of the fractions. Leave them like that. It's a lot easier to get our, our nice, perfect answers. All right, that's the end of it. We are finished up. This is the end of our Unit 11. Uh, I probably will not see you back now in the rest of this course, so it's been great working with you. Uh, rock that mastery check, and we may see you back in next year if you have us again. All right, I'm out.